just uh, about 40 kilometers away from us, uh, still occupying sections of Georgian territory, and still day after day after day, uh, a constant barrage of cyber attacks, and we'll talk about one of them in a moment. Uh, this is serious, it's getting better, and you should assume that like they evaluated everything else about the 2008 war, that they evaluated and then tried to improve their cyber means. Interestingly, when you take a look at Russia at home, the same kinds of techniques are used, not just the same kinds of techniques. You're going to find the same actors, the same IP addresses, the same autonomous systems are used against the Russian domestic opposition. So what we're seeing here is a, a, a regime that regards domestic enemies and foreign enemies as the same. They're all enemies of the state. They are all in for the same kind of treatment, and that treatment includes cyber means, and they use the same sort of thing. Again, I won't read these in the interest of time, but you basically see, on the one hand, the use of cyber means against their internal enemies, and also the attempt to quiet those other people, like Alexei Navalny, who are trying to use the internet for purposes that operate against the regime. Well, when we started looking at this back in 2008, here's the interesting thing, and this gets back to what I was talking about with that trying to, to, to not mirror image when you look at another culture and you're trying to figure out what's going on when you're doing essentially doing intelligence analysis. Um, the West, if you remember the press, kind of screwed itself into the floor trying to figure out who did it. Who did it? Now, some of us said it's pretty obvious who did it, but the Western way of thinking is sort of law enforcement, court of law way of thinking. We have to be able to prove everything beyond a shadow of a doubt, and that's the wrong way to look at intelligence. When we started looking at this, it kept coming back to kids and criminals and criminals and kids. You may recognize that building on the lower right-hand side. Uh, it is a building in suburban St. Petersburg. It is believed to be the headquarters of what was then the Russian Business Network, which was essentially a cyber criminal services organization. It has since kind of evaporated, although not all the principles have disappeared. And then it kept resolving back to a bunch of Nashi kids. So start and stop and think for a minute, though. Do we really believe with everything that's going on? I mean, remember, there's Russian tanks pouring through the Roki Tunnel. All of a sudden, we have cyber attacks that, interestingly, they knew the war was coming and started before the tanks actually started rolling, and then coordinated those attacks with the kinetic attacks. Now, if that was a bunch of Vietnamese teenagers, these are really prescient Vietnamese teenagers. Now, come on, folks. It's pretty obvious what's going on. So we started studying this phenomenon. Okay, it seems to go back to criminals and kids. Why? Well, because what you've got, remember those three circles I showed you, in this unique nexus of Russian government business and crime, it's okay not only is it okay, it might actually be beneficial to use criminals and kids to do the business of the state. Now, if you went to uh, any American government organization, a Georgian government organization, and said in a democratic country, oh, we rather thought we'd like to use these criminals to do the business of the country and we'll pay them on a contract basis, you'd get a what? Well, that can't happen. It's not the case in Russia. Now, how should these guys have dinner together, okay? They're all working together. There's this collusion. So what do you get? You get an amazingly efficient reserve force. These guys, think about a military reserve force. You have reserve forces because you don't need those forces all the time, right? It's cheaper to have them work at a civilian job, and you call them up only when you need them. You still got to buy them equipment. You still got to train them, house them, feed them. It costs some money to keep a reserve force. Imagine if you had a reserve force that not only didn't cost you a single copeck, but actually makes money because when it's not working for the state, it's selling child pornography, it's selling drugs, it's doing all sorts of things on the internet. So they buy their own equipment, they do their own training, they're on the cutting edge 
of all of these techniques they don't cost you anything. You just contract with them to do what you want them to do. And in the meantime, when the Westerners try and look at you and try and figure out this, it really confuses them because you, they don't know what's going on. And so it confounds the attribution. And how many years did we go on after 2008 with article after article after article saying there's no proof it was the Russian government involved? Uh, I think we have to take another look at that. Okay, let's take a little bit a look at the organization. There was once an organization called FOPSI. FOPSI was Gorbachev's attempt to pull at least some of the surveillance uh, capabilities out of the old KGB. I'm not going to tell you FOPSI was a great democratic organization. It was a first step to try and maybe pull some of the power away from the KGB. Okay, forget about FOPSI, because within two years of Vladimir Putin coming to power, FOPSI goes away. Uh, all of the powers of FOPSI go to these organizations, but primarily to the FSB. So everything goes right back to the KGB where it came. NVDK, they're basically cyber cops. If you're not connected with the right people, if you dare to say rob a Russian oligarch, NVDK is coming looking for you. If you are connected with the right people, you don't need to worry about NVDK. Uh, I've got Russian business work, uh, business network in Nashi sort of uh, faded out for two reasons. I've got dotted lines. I think you would be irresponsible in an organization chart for a country like Russia that uses these organizations for its own state business not to put them there, but I put the dotted line. I also want to point out that RBN appears as an organization to have dissolved. We do see occasionally, we see the IP addresses and the autonomous systems, and we'll get to JROBOT in a minute, uh, that are associated or were associated with RBN. And NASHI, though at least the street kids, has been in a, in a Kremlin power, uh, power play, been disbanded. Um, but we think that the cyber, the cyber element of NASHI was still there. Okay, I can't go through all of this, but this is sort of the real world of Kremlin Internet projects. Uh, directed uh, by uh, Lubyanka, the headquarters of the FSB, by the Kremlin itself. Um, the Kremlin Internet Projects chief is a young lady named Kristina Potupchik, formerly the spokeswoman of the Nashi Group. Uh, there are troll factories that are operated on a contract basis with various oligarchs. By the way, Kristina owns one of those troll factories. So when you see these comments, when somebody puts something critical of Russia, and then all of a sudden there's 10 comments to the contrary from the Russians, from the Russian side, that's a, that's, that's a troll factory operating. Everything goes in and out of the church. You have the Internet Safety League, which is pur purportedly there to protect children, and everybody wants to protect children, of course, but it's also used for internal political repression to blacklist certain organizations, certain people who are operating on the internet. Um, so you get this, all of this thing working together as a society does. Uh, just briefly, the organization of the FSB, as we think we understand it, uh, the second directorate is the one that is issuing the political direction. The eighth directorate is doing the cyber defense, basically the technical issue, and those who are doing the surveillance in the 16th directorate. Critical infrastructure protection. Well, here's an area where, for example, Georgia is ahead of the United States. At least it has some kind of a plan for critical infrastructure uh, protection. In the United States, we still don't know who's in charge of non-government-owned critical infrastructure. Easy to fix in Russia, a presidential decree from Vladimir Putin, and who's in charge of critical infrastructure protection in Russia? The FSB, naturally. And two weeks later, we have um, our friend uh, Kaspersky advertising for uh, SCADA experts uh, to, of course, defend the Rodina. 
let me just share with you uh, what we see as four current trends when we look at Russian cyber capabilities. The first of all one is the organization of the cyber troops. They've been talking about it for years and years and years. It looks like they've actually done it. It looks like there are units that are organic uh, at the military district and fleet level uh, that are now uh, the cyber troops. Secondly, the cross-fertilization of government and criminal malware. Well, if you're having dinner together all the time, if you're hiring these guys to do your work, why would you be so surprised if all of a sudden a piece of malware here, a piece of malware there gets lashed together and you get the sort of government and criminal activity together. You are seeing a major, a major strategic espionage campaign directed not only against Russia's neighbors, but against the United States, against the NATO countries, EU countries, all over the world. And then we're seeing another interesting phenomenon. APT groups, advanced persistent threat groups, that aren't so much stealing credit cards. When somebody goes into a bank and steals a credit card number, we know why they're doing it. It's called theft, right? You use it, you make money. But they're, they're collecting geopolitical and economic data. Uh, they're uh, looking at industrial control systems. They're doing surveillance and planting back doors. This is an ordinary crime. Somebody's paying for this. The only kind of organization that is interested in paying for that kind of information is a government. I strongly suspect a government based in Moscow. So let's talk about the military for a moment. Um, gentlemen, could you maybe give me the courtesy of some quiet over there? Could you give me the courtesy of some quiet? Thank you. Um, this military, this development of the military, uh, comes into a very well-developed Russian cyber doctrine. It goes way back to the 80s. Uh, it's rooted in uh, the, uh, the thinking on the military technical revolution. Marshal Ogarkov was the architect of that. I won't go through this, but they also see this as a much wider uh, sort of thing. In the West, we tend to think about there's electronic warfare, there's cyber warfare, there's information warfare. The Russians have kind of an umbrella. They see the whole thing as information warfare. And cyber is just a tool. This thing is a tool. A television is a tool. A newspaper is a tool. You use the tools you have to use to do what you need to do. What we see is also this doctrine that appeared in the 2010 official military doctrine of the Russian Federation. Now one of the things I've noticed watching Russia and before that the Soviet Union for many years is when they're still talking theoretically, things appear in public documents. When they start actually doing it, a theory disappears. So what we saw in the 2014 uh, version of the Russian military uh, doctrine was the talk about what they're trying to do disappeared and the organization of the Russian cyber troops inside the military appeared. I think you can bet that what I have on the top paragraph is exactly what they are trying to do. And isn't that what they tried to do in 2008 in Georgia? There you are. You combine this and you can do some things that are not traditionally assigned to computers that were traditionally you might have done with missiles or artillery or spetsnaz, you can do some of those things in a war with a computer. That's exactly what they're doing now. Okay, the cross-fertilization. Uh, we had a piece of malware called Jiges. Uh, Jiges uh, was basically bolted on. It was a military-grade uh, attack vector. And then all of a sudden we see it being used to deliver things like Crypto Locker and Game Over Zeus. So here what you have is, because it's usually not worth it for criminals to spend the time and the money it takes to develop something like that, but if somebody gives you a copy, you might as well use it, right? So all of a sudden what we see is we see the, the, the combined use of traditional criminal malware with government grade vectors to make a very, very effective criminal attack. Why not use the stuff if somebody's willing to give it to you? Then we have a clearly a massive strategic espionage program. I just have two of them here. Uh, 
Uh, the the uh, uh, snake, Ouroboros, Torla, all the same, basically the same thing. It was reported in the press as if it was new uh, during the Maidan uh, problems in, in Kiev. Actually, it wasn't. It was just two of the companies that had been working on it decided to issue their report when the press was interested in what was going on in Ukraine. In fact, it was a campaign long-standing. You can see in that uh, bottom chart on the bottom left, uh, that blue is, is attacks against Ukraine. So more than half of it directed against the Ukrainians. Uh, the thing that's in sort of that light red is Lithuania and then a variety of other countries. Now here's the interesting thing about Snake. When you analyze it, it turns out to be a relative of Agent BTZ. Agent BTZ was the thing that was deposited in State Department and U.S. Defense Department computers that led to the largest uh, cleanup in American history called Buckshot Yankee. So we've got the same people dealing in espionage, not only against neighbors like Lithuania and Ukraine and, by the way, Georgia, but make no mistake, the same people, the same malware, the same spyware is being used against the United States and its NATO allies. So we're all in this together. And then, of course, if you want to just move a little bit east, uh, J-Robot, uh, we always have to congratulate the big success of the Georgian cert here. Um, there we have the very good-looking gentleman uh, who uh, apparently was responsible for this. Uh, Georgian cert actually re uh, reverse engineered this thing, uh, sent it back to him, and there's a picture of the guy. Um, Well-known uh, relationships with the Russian security services and whatnot. Make no mistake, Jerobot came from, with love from Russia. Then we're seeing these APT gangs, these Advanced Persistent Threat Gangs, getting involved in all sorts of other things. Two of them are APT-28 and Pawn Storm. Um, they're going, they're using the same malware, the same vectors, the kind of stuff you see in some of the criminal campaigns, but now you're seeing it used for basically espionage of geopolitical information. They're not stealing credit card numbers. They're not skip stealing money. That's got to mean that somebody else is paying them. What we see here is essentially is we're, we're, lo we're looking at essentially at forms of espionage, surveillance, reconnaissance for hire. It's espionage as a business. Um, it's only, this kind of information only serves the government. They're looking at the military, government, defense industry, media, and here's one of the latest things. Now, isn't this stuff interesting? Um, an APT group, Pawn Storm, uh, when the, and I cannot pronounce that, people say Georgian is hard to pronounce, and it is, but that is a very long Dutch word, and if there's anybody here from the Netherlands, please help me, but it is the Dutch Transportation Safety, Safety Agency that was investigating the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner. All of a sudden, guess what? They start being, being uh, scanned, and there's an attempt to, uh, to penetrate their computer when? Just before they were about to release the report. Ooh, who might be interested in knowing exactly what that report says? Um, they, I won't go into the details, but basically they set up some fake, uh, some fake servers and they were trying to get credentials. So people were logging into the fake server and uh, they were getting uh, credentials so that they could then use them to access the real server. Um, same time, all of a sudden, Syrian opposition, uh, the Russians are going into Syria, and there's some people in the Middle East who don't think that's a very good idea. Um, some of the Syrian opposition, some Arab governments who don't want Russia in the region. Guess what? Same APT pawn, uh, pawn storm using the same techniques targeting the Syrian opposition and target, targeting the particular Arab governments that had objected to Russian presence in Syria. Then we see the um, the interest in industrial control systems. Now, in industrial control systems, they do all sorts of things. A lot of people call them SCADA systems, which isn't really accurate. A SCADA system is really one kind of industrial control system. But basically what they do is they run industrial systems. Uh, they turn heat on and off, air conditioning on and off. They maintain a temperature. Um, they open uh, the flow of a dam to allow the water to go by. They basically compare a nominal value to what is actual, and they adjust whatever the machine is 
to whatever that is. We need them. Uh, the air conditioning in his building is probably uh, controlled by a small industrial control system. Actually, it's called a building control system. Um, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, we see this uh, another APT called Sandworm, uh, very, very interested in gaining access to industrial control systems, and more, in gaining access to the companies that make industrial control systems. Uh, somebody's really interested in how you turn the lights on and off, how you get the dam to work, how you get the, go the train to go that way instead of that way. Once again, not a lot of money in this. You don't get credit card numbers from an industrial control system. The only thing you can get from an industrial control system is the ability to alter whatever little thing it controls. Oh, the little thing it controls is just two trains on that one track there as it comes into some tradia and boom, there you go. Okay? Um, so who's interested in this sort of thing? Same question. And then we see um, the targeting of, um, of certain organizations and laying, apparently putting um, um, remote access Trojans, back doors, this sort of thing. Now why would you do that? You come in, you take a look around, you've already gained access. If there's anything you want to steal, you might as well steal it. But you don't steal anything. You just take a look around, study the system, lay a back door, and you say, uh, what would you say? Does um, And you leave it. Okay? Um, why would you do that? Well, I've got a classic attack cycle at the bottom there. Some people would draw it a little differently. But presumably you're doing that in case you want to come back later. Uh, so what we may have here is throughout the West, and including Georgia, what we may have is Russian APTs laying back doors that can be used under certain contingencies at a later time. So this is kind of the short version, as I said, uh, but I did learn how to uh, make a presentation in the United States military, and they always told us, tell them what you're going to tell them, which I did. Tell them, which I think I did quite well, and then tell them what you told them. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what I told you. There is a unique nexus of government business and crime due to the systemic corruption in Russia, and it affects everything. This country uses oligarchs, kids, and criminals to do its cyber business against its enemies, foreign and domestic. They have a comprehensive view of information warfare. They use it internally and externally. And we are seeing some trends. The cross-fertilization of government and criminal malware, systematic espionage, very possibly the targeting of industrial control systems to control various uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, the Kremlin and the FSB are the ones orchestrating this. And you know, we spend so much time in the West trying to figure out what it is they're doing. And we have a saying in English, if it looks like a duck, and it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck. Ladies and gentlemen, it just may be a duck. Thank you very much for your attention.